get into the, the big topic of open source, something that we actually have. Right. Right. This is so we awesome. We are an open culture that it believes is actually in a big piece so of it's that process yeah. that a developer, or let's say, as the Kubernetes ecosystem really boomed. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I'm Johnny Rickard, and I am the co-host of the Ask an OpenShift Admin live stream. Uh, you may know that, or you may notice that Andrew is not with us today. Uh, he's actually out doing a uh, customer demo. Uh, so good luck to Andrew. Hopefully he made his sacrifices to the demo gods and everything goes well. So again, good luck. Um, today we're going to talk about... Um, Kubernetes, or excuse me, OpenShift for Kubernetes admins. So as we all know, OpenShift is enterprise Kubernetes, uh, but there's a lot of subtle differences that make it, I think, difficult for some people to, not some people, but difficult for organizations to kind of like wrap their heads around about like what makes OpenShift so different. So we're going to talk about some of the differences. Uh, we'll walk through, I actually have a couple of clusters deployed. I have um, a Kubernetes cluster, and then I have an OpenShift cluster. And so we'll kind of see the differences side by side of what they look like. Um, just wanted to follow up from last week on some of the things that we were talking about. So one of the uh, topics that came up was multiple cluster management from the command line. And we talked about a couple of products and one of them was kubectx. And what kubectx does is it allows you to, from the CLI, switch context between your clusters. So if you have three clusters or four clusters, then you can, uh, you know, you can run kubectx and switch in between those contexts pretty simply. Um, I found another website, and thanks to R Hope Nine uh, for reaching out and showing this to me as well. But there's another thing called kube-ps1, and what it does is it changes the prompt on your terminal to um, to match your um uh your context so let me try and share my screen really quick and we'll just see if we can look at this all right and to make this a little bit bigger all right so hopefully everybody can see that but i have i have three clusters and so as we can see, I have one, this is my snow. So I have a single node open shift. And then I have uh, a cluster called MVP 396 hub. And then I have a Linode cluster, uh, which is my Kubernetes cluster. And so for me, if I want to switch between, you know, say maybe I want to go to my snow. I can actually, you know, again, see that, oh, hey, look, I've got my snow machine. And then if I want to switch to my Linode cluster, or actually let's switch to my other OpenShift cluster. So pretty simply, oh, of course, so I, I need to figure out what's going on with my uh, kube config. But basically the idea is that I can switch between my context pretty easily. Let me just make sure. All right, here we go. So this is my line node cluster. And then if I do kubectx again. Okay. I think it's because I renamed my context. Um, but the ps1-kube puts this nice little uh, prompt on your, on your display. So it's telling me what cluster I'm using and then what, um, or excuse me, it's telling me what, yeah, what, what cluster I'm using and then it's also saying which uh, namespace I'm in. And the cool part about this kube PS1 is I can do a kube off, and then I just have my normal uh, my normal PS1 prompt, and then kube on. So it's kind of like Ninja Turtles, where it's like kube off, kube on. All right, sorry, that's a silly joke. Uh, so I, let me grab the link to both of those projects. And then I found a blog as well from the developer of uh, uh, excuse me, kubectx, where it's kind of like, it's the ninja skills of uh, kubectx. So this is kubeps1. 
And then this is going to be Kube CTX. And then finally, this is the blog that I was telling you about. Let's see, Christian says the issue he has with tools like this is that they don't exactly do what he needs. Yeah, exactly, Christian, exactly. So like there's there's definitely been some uh, some tweaking, you know, like I've, I've tried to, uh, <laughs> I spent probably way longer than I, I needed to on the Kube PS1 just because I, I was trying to make it work with uh, Oh My ZSH. It, 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 there's a plugin for it that you can use, but it, it actually, um, I was having issues with getting it to work. So I just did it the old school way where I'm sourcing the script and then I had to go and change some things because I didn't like that um, it was it was adding the, the full cluster name URL. So it was like, you know, cluster name dot, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so I went in and I added a, a section where it actually strips a lot of that down and it just gives you the short name. I think I actually got the idea from uh, our hope nine. Um, but these two tools together, they're not perfect, but they definitely they definitely make life a little bit easier, especially now that I'm jumping around between like different flavors of OpenShift and um, different different versions of like Kubernetes and stuff like that too. And yeah, I looked at PureLine as well, Christian. Yeah, that's a good one. All right, so then the, the next thing that we wanted to talk, oh, and the next announcement that I have is that Today is my daughter's uh, 12th birthday. So happy birthday, Caitlin, uh, or Katie, as she likes to be called. I was going to share a picture of her, but I, I, I'm afraid of the internet trolls. And so uh, everybody just knows that my daughter's birthday is today. Uh, so that's it. Uh, let's see. The other thing that we had going on is um, there's no stream uh, next week because the uh, what's next in the OpenShift 4.12 live stream is going to be happening. And so... Uh, folks like myself, Christian, uh, Soli will all be there to, to help answer questions uh, if you have any. Um, and then uh, on the week of Thanksgiving, which is the next week. So here in the States, we have, uh, you know, it's it's uh, Glutton Day, uh, which is Thanksgiving on, I think it's the 23rd. Uh, but that Wednesday before, we're not going to, we're not going to have a stream. Uh, so we'll pick up the week after. And uh We've got a few topics coming up, um, but if there's anything that you're really interested in in uh, hearing or uh, talking about, let us know. Uh, there's some that we like. We really want to try and we're trying to get some of the product teams to come on and um, you know come do some demos and come talk to us, like like the deep nerd stuff that we want to that we all really want to hear. Uh, and the last thing is, I was looking on the blog or cloud.redhat.com slash blog. And um, there's a pretty cool blog on what's new with OpenShift logging. And there's also, there's a bunch of blogs on ACM and different things that you can do within ACM. So if you're interested in ACM or if you're using ACM and you're trying to, you're trying to learn how to extend it or do different things, like take a look at blog.redhat.com. I, I did it again. Cloud.redhat.com slash blog and look for all the ACM stuff because there's just a ton out there. Uh, but this OpenShift logging, uh, there's a lot of new features that are coming out. Like there's uh, Vector, and then there's another one I just can't remember the name of. Uh, but there's there's a lot of cool features that are coming out. And you know, if you've been watching the stream for the last few weeks or months, even I I keep getting excited about the evolution of the product because these things are just there. All of these different things that we've been using for a long time, like OpenShift logging. You know, like it's been a great tool. It's been a great product, and it's just worked. And now it's it's evolving and it's we're getting some of these new, like newer, better, faster, you know, deeper logging tools that are just going to be they're going to be awesome to implement. And it's going to be cool to see how um, everybody else is using them. And thank you, Christian, for doing that. And yeah, Rick. Uh, <laughs> yeah. As soon as I as soon as the thought came into my mind to post a picture, I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, there's also a if you watch the uh, if you remember a few months ago, they did a Kubernetes documentary like the the origins and all that uh, Kelsey Hightower. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name from OpenShift that was on there. Uh, Loki, if that's it, our hope, man. Thank you. Um, well, they're doing a similar one with Prometheus. So there's a uh, documentary promo. I'm not sure when they're going to actually publish the video. But uh, I saw the promo. It seems like it's going to be interesting. So for all the super nerds out there, th this should be. Uh, this should be a good watch. Um, 
All right, cool. So let's get into it. The first thing I, I, I'd like to ask is, can just from a, you know, from your from your point of view, like what do you think are the biggest differences between OpenShift and Kubernetes? Um, there's, I'm, we're going to go through a few different things, but I'm just, I'm, I'm interested to see what the viewers think uh, are the biggest differences and, and kind of like some of the challenges of going from Kubernetes to, um, to OpenShift or OpenShift to Kubernetes. And I, I lied, I do need to add one more thing because I just saw Dwayne and it, it triggered a reminder. Um, so I was out looking for something last week or week before last and uh, there's a project called Kube by example and um, I, I finally went to the website and checked it out and it, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. So just if you get a chance, take a look at it. If you're just trying to learn like like different things about Kubernetes or you know just just different stuff, let me know. Um, or you know take a look at this website and if you have any further questions, let me know. You can reach out to me at uh, Johnny at redhat.com or I'm at jrocktx1 on Twitter or I'm also on Reddit too. So uh, if you need anything, you know, feel free to reach out to me. And Andrew's the same way. Uh, he's uh, Andrew Practical Andrew at uh, uh, at Twitter. Oh yeah, so see, like Christian's already out there. He's already got his argument. I think that's actually what I was looking at, Christian. That might have been the trigger. Um, and then there's another one, and I think it's learn.kubernetes. Learn it's learnkates.io. Yeah. All right, this is the other one. So I was just checking this stuff out. It's it's if you're interested in learning Kubernetes or if you're interested in learning OpenShift, you know, take a look at some of these like these websites because they have a lot of cool stuff out there, and you know, it, it's it's good to refresh, um, you know, some of the things that we think we know, you know, and uh, it as I was like getting ready for this live stream, it, I kind of like just reflecting on how I got here, and when I first started, you know, I went I got thrown right into an OpenShift bootcamp, and then um, I was kind of lost, and so I ended up going the CKA, so the Certified Kubernetes Admin route. And um, I, I feel like learning the basics from like the the, the core, you know, like it, from all the like the, the Kubernetes primitives and stuff like that. So like secrets and um, you know config maps and you know deployment, you know, all these things, and um, then translating that back over to OpenShift and seeing like, oh, okay, that's how. Okay, got it, got it, got it. So um, making that that kind of like correlation between like it's it's the same you know we're we're literally talking kubernetes all the time right there's just some things that openshift does a little bit differently um and then the same thing with the ckad you know and then what i did is i i took both of those exams and then i took the do280 uh, which is the openshift admin exam and then the uh, do288 which is the openshift admin or the openshift developer exam so the the parity between Kubernetes admin and uh, Kubernetes app dev, you know, and then the OpenShift admin and OpenShift app dev. Uh, and that helped, I think, clear up a lot of things that were maybe, um, uh, you know, abstract to me. Like they just didn't make, it didn't make complete sense. But now that I've seen like the whole picture, it, it really does make things a lot easier for me to understand, especially when it comes to uh, debugging. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully you guys can find those links uh, useful. Um, and then let's see, I'm just gonna go back to the chat real quick. Uh, support and updates, operators. All right, got it. Christian, you know, patting himself on the back with his uh, Argo CD learning path. Yeah, all right, cool. All right, so the first thing that I'd like to talk about or that I think we, we should talk about is the um, the install experience. So, and this, this is in no way slamming, uh, you know, Kubernetes or uh, you know, saying that OpenShift is way better than than OpenShift, um, or that OpenShift is way better than Kubernetes or anything like that. I'm, I'm just going to try and be as transparent and honest about you know my experience with um, you know, deploying OpenShift and then deploying Kubernetes. Uh, and yes, Dwayne, I did have uh, I do have a home lab, um, but I did do the 280 through the uh, uh, Red Hat learning stuff. And so the way that I'll do those things is I'll go through the course and then I'll try and replicate what they have in the, in the environment. So that way, uh, one, I'm learning how to build everything the same way that they're doing it. 
and then um, I can practice those scenarios just with different contexts and different things. And it, it kind of helps me just kind of get like the big picture on how all the things are built together and how they interconnect. Um, yeah, and, and insoles, it's one of those things where you just you sit there and just kind of hammer at it and hammer at it and hammer at it until you know where to look for your your errors, right? So if you're, especially on disconnected, you know, like you'll get to a point where you'll see an error or you'll see something not happening and you'll automatically know like, okay, I need to go check here and then start working your way closer, you know, back towards the problem. Um, but to get back on path, and I'm sorry if I'm jumping around. I normally have Andrew here to pace me and to like, you know, keep me on track. And, you know, I actually, I just lean on Andrew a lot. So uh, I'll, I'll do my best to not jump around too much because I, I, I'm crazy. Uh, but yeah, so with installing OpenShift, I'm going to paste the link to uh, the, the public documentation. And then I'm going to come over here. And it's, you know, they have, they have different environments that you can set up. So you can set up your production environment. You can set up like a lab or you can do, you know, I'm just trying to kick the tires, right? Like, so like a mini cube or something like that. Uh, so what you do is you just go through their documentation and, um, you know, so again, they have a getting started learning environment. You know, you can do kind mini cube, Kubadium. I've, I've always used Kubadium to deploy uh, Kubernetes uh, until yesterday uh, where I, I did a, I, I built an EKS cluster in AWS, and then I built a cluster in Linode, uh, just out of curiosity. And also on Linode, uh, they have a hundred dollar credit for or sixty days. So if you are interested and um, you know you need some you need some assistance uh, or you need resources, then check out Linode. Um, I don't have an affiliate link or anything like that. So I'm, I'm literally just telling you to go out there and get your free hundred bucks. Uh, Google also does like a $300 credit. Um, and I think AWS does a free credit as well. Um, and definitely digital ocean. Uh, so just go out and, and take a look at their services, sign up and then, you know, stack them. So that way you can go to different clouds and, uh, you know, get your free resources for a while. And then that way you can live off the cloud, uh, for free for a little bit. So then. Like I said, I've always used the Kube ADM install guide. And for me, I, I I use Ubuntu and I've deployed on Ubuntu and it's it's very straightforward when you're using Ubuntu. Um, but because I am, you know, one, I'm Red Hat, but I also, you know, I use Fedora as my daily driver. So um, I'll generally deploy Kubernetes on top of either Fedora or uh, RHEL platform. And some of the gotchas there are that out of the box, you have to disable SC Linux, otherwise the, the pods will fail. And so, or not the pods, but the, the install will fail. So you have to disable, um, you have to disable SC Linux. And then across the platform, right, across Linux in general, you have to disable swap. Um, so there's just certain like little nuancings that you have to take care of. Uh, with, with OpenShift, you know, it, it, the default runtime, container runtime is Cryo. Uh, when you do a DIY Kubernetes, it's, you know, bring your own, essentially. So you can do cryo, you can do, um, Docker's been deprecated, but you could do, uh, again, container D, uh, or you can use Docker engine using cryo Docker D or cry Docker D. Um, but yeah, so I generally what I'll do is I'll install using kubeadm, and then I will uh, disable SC Linux and then install the packages. And once you've installed, uh, the, the Kubernetes aspect of it, what you'll do is you need to add a uh, SDN. Now, what will happen is you can, there's so many different SDNs that you can pick. Like you can either do uh, Calico or Flannel or uh, there, there's just a ton. Um, and so generally the popular one is Calico. And so that's one that I'll normally deploy. And in my Linode cluster, they deployed Calico. So we can see it right here. They deployed the Calico SDN. And um, yeah, so then Calico is great. And then what you'll need after that is you'll need to start setting up your um, your additional services. You know, So like if you want to use an ingress controller, uh, then you'll need to set up your ingress controller. And that is 
out of the box, not a default or not a standard deployment. So you'd have to either use Nginx Ingress is the easiest one, in my opinion, to install because there's a Helm chart and you just run it. And as long as you have a load balancer service, uh, it'll it'll connect to that. Um, the other cool thing is you can deploy the Ingress. And then if you're using bare metal, you can deploy like a metal LB uh, load balancer and then have your Ingress pick up a service address from that metal LB. Or if you're in the cloud like Linode, it will pick up the uh, the service from uh, the Linode uh, cloud. So if I do OC get service minus N, this is my public address to my load balancer. And so um, now what I can do is in DNS, I'll add, I can add an A record or a C name or whatever pointing back to either uh, this IP address or to the uh, the public host name of this IP address. Uh, and then I can use either wildcard apps or, or wildcard DNS or I could actually do like a, um, you know, a, a targeted DNS entry, you know, like a, 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 an A record for whatever application I have. Um, Rick asked, why choose Kube ADM over Kind or Minikube for single node local cluster? Um, so I use Kube ADM and the way I do it is I will install or I'll create a master and then n number of workers. And so that's why I do it that way. So I'm, I'm deploying generally more than one, uh, one node. Um, when I was learning, like for uh, for my uh, CKAD, I believe I was using Minikube all the time. And then uh, when I was going for CKA, because you have to do, I believe it's the CKA where you add another cluster. Uh, that's where I started using like the uh, Kubeadm to deploy multiple nodes. And um, yeah, and, and Kubeadm, it just it was the most straightforward and well documented and well blogged uh, way of deploying Kubernetes. Uh, so to me, it was just, it was the no brainer. And I, I don't know if I've, to be honest, I'm not sure if I've ever used kind. So I, I've definitely used Minikube and I've definitely used uh, KubeADM, but I, I'm, I do not believe I've ever used kind. Um, and so then moving away from the Kubernetes install, um, then, and going into OpenShift now, if you've been around for a while and you've used OpenShift 3, the installer used to be, you know, it used to be Ansible. So you would you'd create an inventory, you would do, uh, you'd have to update it with all your hosts, you'd have, there's all these things that you could do, like you could literally turn every switch. And um, it it was, it was beautifully imperfect, you know, like there were times, if you had your inventory file correct and your your hosts and everything were set up, you like your networking and everything was just great, then you could reliably, repeatedly deploy your OpenShift cluster. It, and it was pretty awesome to see. Um, and then the evolution comes of OpenShift 3 to OpenShift 4, where it's strictly, or, or it's all operator based. And then we move from like a RHEL, you know, uh, like a Red Hat Enterprise Linux normal operating system into like a core OS uh, uh, container, or, or uh, operating system built for containers. And that kind of changed the way that we do these things. And so in in my mind, in the way I see it, I think it's gotten easier. And definitely since, you know, like the early releases of four up until uh, up until now, like with 4.11 about to be soon to be 4.12, uh, the, the, the way that you can deploy and how you can deploy and where you can deploy is just, it's ongoing and just getting better and better and better. And it, it's one of those things where it's like, sometimes too much is too much. And like, you're like, man, I just can't keep up. But it's it's nice to have when you are, uh, you're trying to deploy to, you know, I had a customer that wanted to deploy to AWS and to Azure uh, government regions. And, you know, having that ability to, you know, just kind of like pivot towards one cloud and then make it work and get it working and then pivot to, you know, you know, Microsoft, Azure, and then deploy there. And then literally using uh, Ansible and Helm together uh, to, to generate these install configs and then just run it. Uh, here's the top level link to the OpenShift 4.11 installing. Um, and one of the things about Kubernetes and OpenShift in general, right, is like the, the they can pretty much be deployed anywhere. You know, like if you can, if you can host compute, you can host Kubernetes uh, for the most part. Uh, I, I don't think that there's been, I, I don't know if there's a, a platform yet that doesn't support um, either one in like some, like either like a uh, uh, non-integrated fashion, uh, you know, or or even just straight up Kubeadm. 
Uh, but with, with OpenShift, I think initially, like you had to have the three control planes and the three worker nodes, or at least one worker node. And that's a lot of infrastructure for people and for organizations that don't necessarily have a lot of compute resources. And so, um, you know, I think Red Hat picked up on that and they said, okay, well, let's go to the compact cluster, which is the three node. And then we we're like, well, we have the edge. You know, I like edge, well, I can't fit three nodes on the edge or, you know, in my tiny data center, I have a little rack out on the, you know, out, out in the middle of nowhere. And so, uh, yeah, okay, you got me. I, th I think that CRC local, or uh, I'm sorry, OpenShift local works on the M1 Mac. So I'd have to ask Sully because uh, he's got the, uh, he's got the, uh, the M1 Mac. Well, I'll find out for you, Rick. Um, but so then, you know, even even with the edge and and compact clusters, they said, all right, let's do single node OpenShift. And then even that was kind of too big. And so then we said, all right, well, let's create this project called MicroShift. And MicroShift is very similar to a K3s, which K3s is just a binary uh, that you install and it gives you a Kubernetes API. And so um, MicroShift does the same thing, or it, it, it responds in a very similar way. And it, it supports ARM, so you can put it on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, you can you pretty much run anywhere. So if you think from the smallest device, you know, if you think like a, a device sitting in a backpack or, you know, a, a belt somewhere or even in a car or uh, on a plane, anything, right? All the way out to your data center and all the way out to the cloud, there's an answer, uh, except for maybe the M1 Max. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's an answer for getting either OpenShift or Kubernetes in your environment. And um, you know the, the translation between the two is is pretty awesome. And uh, the other one is I, I'm I'm skipping around. I apologize. So we, we have Kind uh, for Kubernetes, and then we also have uh, Minikube. And we used to have uh, Mini Shift, and then that went to CRC, and now that is OpenShift Local, which is what Rick is talking about. Uh, and CRC Local is a it's a uh, condensed OpenShift. Uh, cluster that sits on your laptop or on your, your PC, and uh, it gives you a pretty feature-rich uh, OpenShift environment. It's 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 not 100% OpenShift. Like there, I think the machine API isn't isn't installed, but uh, there are some subtle differences. Uh, but just going back to the install, you know, with a connected cluster on in the cloud, you can either go Rosa which is the Red Hat OpenShift for AWS, uh, which is a, it's a, it's a, a resource in the marketplace that you can go and select and it'll deploy your cluster. Uh, and then the other is ARO, uh, which is the Azure, uh, Azure Red Hat OpenShift. And um, same idea, right? You go and you click, you say, hey, I want a cluster. And then you fill some stuff out and then you've got a cluster in Azure. Uh, I think, and I don't know if Christian knows, um, but there's, I think that there's supposed to be a, a Google marketplace type solution for uh, Red Hat OpenShift. I'm just not 100% certain. Um, but from a from a usability at standpoint, right? You have you have Arrow and you have Rosa, and then you know AWS has EKS, uh, which is their uh, managed Kubernetes, and then you also have uh, AKS, which is Azure, and then GCP has their own, I think it's called GKS. And then um, my node has their own, which is LKE. Uh, and DigitalOcean has their, so everybody's got a flavor of, of Kubernetes and or OpenShift uh, that you can go out and you can easily deploy. Uh, oh, thank you, Christian. You're awesome. Uh, where you can go out and deploy a cluster very quickly and, you know, get your workloads out there and, and just get, Get down to get down to business, you know, and just get after it, um, and that's pretty awesome. So, when you when you think about like the deployment problems, right? Like the, all the deployment woes that we had two years ago, or even you know, maybe even a year ago at some point, like it, it's just gotten so much better and so streamlined. And there's a lot of testing, and uh, you can do nightly builds if you want to see the features, and uh, you know, with like with Kubernetes, you can just you can do these things side by side, and then now, if you take ACM and you add this layer above your OpenShift and Kubernetes clusters, now you can manage these clusters through ACM and even down at the MicroShift level. And so just like the evolution of the technology, it's just it's it's incredible to be a part of. And like I'm I, I do. I get super excited and super giddy about it because uh, it it's 
pretty damn awesome. Um, so I, I don't know if anybody has any examples of install experiences that you want to talk about. Like for for Kube, Kube ADM, again, it's pretty straightforward. I have a I think I have an Ansible playbook or something like that that I use. So if you're interested in that, let me know and I'll share it. And just don't you know don't be judgy, don't be mean. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll I'll share it and uh, you can take a look and hopefully you can use it. Uh, to install the Linode cluster, I just went to their cluster manager and when Marketplace Kubernetes requested a cluster, you know, I gave it a, a, an ID or a label and then um, went away and it just kind of, it, it did everything for me, which was pretty awesome. Um, the, the next thing I'd like to talk about what the difference is, is like the, the out of the box experiences that you get. So we kind of briefly touched on, um, you know, having to install an ingress controller with with uh, Kubernetes raw, and with I'll start with OpenShift because it's easier to talk about all the things that it has than what it doesn't have, and then I'll go into Kubernetes a little bit. So with with OpenShift out of the box, it's literally a full fledged enterprise grade Kubernetes service. You know, so you have a dashboard, you have SSL uh, APIs. Um, all right, Dwayne, I got you. I'll hook it up. Um, I've got, or uh, so then you've got like the uh, the machine APIs, there's an ingress controller, uh, there are CSIs, the container storage interface, uh, and then, you know, the SDN, it's all, it's all built in and out of the box. So as soon as you deploy OpenShift, you have those things. With, with OpenShift, single node OpenShift, uh, you don't get the machine API, but you get everything else. But if you were to do like a compact cluster, then uh, you definitely have uh, the machine APIs, which are which give you the machines, you get the machine configs. Uh, so there's all this like technology that's packed into uh, OpenShift. So when people ask why OpenShift is heavy or why it takes a long time to deploy, it's because we're we're deploying the nodes and then we're laying down these these features on top of it. You know, so like again, the the OpenShift console, we're laying down uh, Prometheus for metrics and we're laying down uh, the machine API so that way we can we can manage our machines as as kubernetes resources uh and it's pretty cool to see like how far it's come and um you know i think when you when you're looking for a batteries included solution it it's it's hard to find something else that you know that that has a lot of parity to it in, in my opinion um on the kubernetes side i think the biggest the biggest thing for me with just raw kubernetes is it is so easy you know like once you figure out like uh, and just reading the docs and stuff like that like once you've got it it's easy to deploy you know because you can write an ansible playbook and you can go out and do these things and, and have it deploy um i think where it gets complicated is if if you're not if you're not really savvy on how the the services work and how ingress controllers work and and stuff like that and how how traffic gets into your cluster and down to your application i think that's where it can be challenging um, I, I think if you are not familiar with the storage interfaces and how to how to um, you know add storage to your clusters or how to add uh, how to create a storage class or modify or not, well you can't modify but how to create a storage class and do all those things I think that's where it probably gets a little complex for some folks um, but if you're a seasoned vet and you've been doing this stuff for a while then you know it, it's hard to argue against the the simplicity of Kubernetes because you can literally stand up a cluster in a matter of minutes with uh, kubeadm. Um, now, with with a raw Kubernetes install, you don't get SSL terminated uh, API calls. Uh, you know, you don't get a console. Uh, you do not get an ingress controller. Uh, there's all these things that you you have to do, right? So it's essentially you get a model, and then you have to put all the pieces together to fit your needs. Whereas uh, whereas that with OpenShift, right? You just you go and you get the you get the car and you can keep it in the box and you know you can do your thing with it and show it off and you know work on it and stuff like that. And security, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to get there. I'm just jumping around. It, the other part too with, um, uh, with OpenShift is like security is baked in, right? There's, there's just security through and through. Um, you know, we, we implement SCCs, which are secure security context uh, constraints, and then um, we also are with Kubernetes uh, 1.25. We're moving away from the um, admission controller. And go to the emission plugin. I might, I may, I may have said that backwards, but by default, OpenShift out of the box is inherently secure. And 
you know, there's it, there's same defaults that restrict the use of uh, certain registries. So if you have a if you have an image and it is, uh, you know, it's in a it's in an external registry and uh, you don't have the credential for it, then you'll have to add that credential in uh, the pull secret, and then you'll have to add that registry to, um, you know, like an allowed list within the operator, and then. The OpenShift, the OpenShift image registry can actually start pulling those images in and uh, working with it. Um, so there's there's just a ton of things that that OpenShift provides that are awesome, and the SSL is a, a huge one. Uh, the, open, the ingress controller is a, another big one. Um, not to say that you couldn't do all of this on Kubernetes, right? There's uh, Kelsey Hightower has a guide. Uh, it's called Kubernetes the Hard Way. Um, and then if you are on a Cloud Guru or Linux Academy or something like that, um, they actually have a course that goes through Kubernetes the hard way. Uh, so and that's their their whole course is built around that Kelsey Hightower uh, repo. So if if you're if you are deploying Kubernetes and that's what your your environment's all about, then maybe take a look at that course so that way you can have an enterprise grade raw or vanilla Kubernetes uh, deployment kind of put together. Uh, the other aspect of of all this is that OpenShift is is for it, it, it's if you want to try it, there's a 60 day trial license that you can do. If if you're doing this in your home lab or if you're doing this in a development environment that only you are working on, then use your developer subscription. With your developer subscription, you get up to 16 nodes of uh, fully featured OpenShift. If you do uh, the trial subscription for 60 days. You've got a, you've got a fully featured OpenShift cluster that you can you can go kick the tires on. Uh, compute's compute, right? I mean that that you're going to pay for that regardless of what you're using. If you're paying for if you're using Kubernetes or if you're using OpenShift, um, so keep in mind that there's different ways to get involved or get your hands on OpenShift where you don't actually have to pay for anything. So the the 60 day trial it, again, it's a full featured subscription to OpenShift, and you can. Download and install any cloud you want. If you want to do bare metal or if you want to do uh, assisted installer, you can do all of that. Uh, the developer subscription is the same way. And again, you get up to 16 nodes. And as long as you're using a, it's a single person, so you, uh, and you're not using product or you're not using it for production workloads, then you have 16 free nodes of OpenShift and you can go crazy. Uh, and with Kubernetes, it, it's an open source project, right? So it, it is completely free. And you can use that all the time and you can pull the nightlies if you wanted to and, and stay in sync that way. Um, the OpenShift, the way that we do updates is we, we test all of our updates and then we deploy them out to, uh, after they've been tested, they'll, they'll end up in the stable channel. And so if you're following stable, like you're that enterprise customer that wants to, um, all right, Rick, hey, catch you later, man. Thanks for showing up. Um, but yeah, so if, if you're that enterprise customer that needs to have consistency and you need to have, um, you know, I, I need to know what my updates are going to do and make sure you know that they're not going to break, then you would, you'd be that customer that waits on the stable channel and then upgrade your cluster that way. Because we go through a uh, pretty rigorous testing process to get those packages out into stable. And so then when you update, you have that, that sense of uh, confidence and, you know, personal technical security, I guess, that. I'm going to install this update and it's not going to break my cluster. Uh, and, and that's, that's, you know, that, that's a, that's a, that's a big tool to have in your tool bag, you know, to, to know that like I can do this thing to have the confidence to be able to update your cluster uh, without, you know, bringing it to its knees. Um, and that whole process, the whole update process has again, evolved and just gotten better and better and better uh, that with Kubernetes, it's going to be like, um, it's, it's going to be like you're updating RPMs. You know, there's going to be times where you'll have to uh, cordon off your nodes. You'll have to update the repo versions that your, your, your yum repos or whatever it's called in Ubuntu. And then you'll have to update those versions. Then you'll have to unlock certain features if you're using Ubuntu and then uh, update. And then as you're updating, you know, go back to your other, you know, control plane or your other worker node and then do the same thing. So that way you can keep everything on the same, on the same version. Uh, so just some little things. Oh, Little big things, big little things that to keep in mind when you're when you're making this consideration of like why would I choose OpenShift over a raw Kubernetes, uh, and it just comes down to like what services and what functions do you need at the end of the day to make sure that your service is available to your customers or to your uh, to your company.
Um, so the other, outside of uh, the console, we also provide, OpenShift provides a internal registry. And it's a, it's a pretty full feature registry. It's not like, uh, it's not exactly a quay or key if you're, if you're a key guy, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a pretty full feature registry. You can push and pull images from it. You can set up auth. Uh, there, you can namespace applications. Um, the other part is we provide an OAuth service out of the box. Uh, so you get uh, Kubidium, you could do, uh, I do not know why I cannot ever think of this, uh, of what this is called. Um, the HTTP, it's, ugh, I can't think of it. Anyways, it's the HTTP config stuff. Um, or if you wanted to use OAuth and authenticate to a, a GitHub or to a public, you know, uh, authentication service, we did an episode on that not too long ago, uh, where you could use GitHub as your OAuth service and then log in using your GitHub account. Uh, you could also use a key cloak or SSO or for your SSO, if you want to use single sign-on, and then either use Keycloak as your source of truth for users, or you can even have different backends like an Active Directory or an LDAP or even a GitHub or whatever. Uh, so there's all these different hooks that are kind of built in out of the box that you could essentially run right into and just start, you know, if you have a, uh, a Helm chart that does it, load that Helm chart and get after it. Uh, or if you have, you know, the old school GitOps where you just have the manifest and you, you know, OC apply minus F the, the manifest, you can do that as well. Um, and the other part is the uh, console. So let me just switch context here. And we'll go to. So the OpenShift console is, you know, pretty robust. There's a lot of information that we get just from the dashboard. Um, and this is a single node OpenShift. So if I go over to my compute and then nodes, we see I only have my single node here. And uh, I have this running on, uh, it's, it's like a NUC. It's a ASUS PN50 or something like that. Um, but it's just a, it's a tiny machine. It's got 64 gigs of RAM, uh, but it's perfect for snow because it's this little bitty box that just sits over in the corner of my desk and I don't even know it's there. And I've got a full fledged open shift. Um, but we can see from the dashboard that I've got, a, I've got different contexts. So as an administrator, I have all the, all the goodies, you know, all the, all the buttons that I need to click and, and stuff like that. And then as a developer, I have another view that gives me access to show the topology of things, or, you know, if I want to deploy Helm charts or things like that. So, Full featured uh, OpenShift, you know, console is it's it's pretty awesome. When composable OpenShift hits the streets, uh, one of the things that they're going to uh, allow you to remove from your deployment is, and I don't know if it's going to be in the first release or just a, you know, a, you know, down the road release, but a goal was to have the uh, OpenShift console be part of that composable OpenShift. So, say I don't need a an OpenShift console, I can just strip that out. Maybe I don't want the internal registry, so I can strip that out as well. And, you know, maybe I have a Quay or a Nexus or Artifactory that already exists. Um, so we have all of these different uh, things that we're going to get to the point where we can actually start taking stuff out of the deployment. So the, the deployment doesn't seem so so big and you're not putting in services that you don't really need or want, you know, because maybe maybe you don't ever want anybody to have access to the OpenShift console. Maybe you want everybody to use the CLI or the API uh, or you know, uh, since Christian's there, you know, you want to use GitOps or you want to use CI CD tools uh, to deploy those things or, or to manage those resources. I think ultimately that's the goal. You know, we, we want to keep as many hands out of the cookie jar as possible uh, and be able to track and, and uh, trace all the things that are happening. Um, but just again, out of out of the box deployments, we can see that there's just um, a number of resources that are automatically available to us. Uh, so if I wanted to, let me see, I don't know if I have any, yeah, so I don't have any operators installed, but if I wanted to deploy operators, I could go through my OLM and install that. I could on um, Kubernetes, but I think it's a little bit more, uh, I've never done it. So I, I'm, I'm just kind of like flying by the seat of my pants here, but it, it seems like it, you know, you just install OLM and then you add your, your catalogs and then away you go. Um, so if it's the same as, as an OpenShift, then that's awesome. 
I, I hope it is. Uh, and then, you know, just normal Kubernetes primitives and stuff like that. So we have the batch API that provides cron jobs and jobs. Uh, we have daemon sets, replica sets, all that stuff. Uh, on the networking side, uh, we have our, uh, we can in implement network uh, policies. We can, we have ingresses. So with OpenShift, if you create an ingress, it will automatically create a route resource. Uh, in Kubernetes, you create an ingress. You do not create a route. A route is part of the OpenShift API. And so just to kind of walk through this, if I do a OC, uh, that's not right. Uh, I cannot think of the command API resources, I think. Oh, yeah. My autocomplete is broken and it, I'm upset. All right, so if I grow up for OpenShift. We can see now like all of the things and here, here's all of the part, all of the things in the OpenShift API that get provided to our cluster. So we have OAuth, we have the network operator, we have machine configs, we have the machine API, uh, we have our images API, uh, we have the Helm. So if I wanna see what's in the Helm, API. So if I do an OC API resources and then get uh or API group, that's what it is. And then helm.shift.io. We can see that this API, it provides the Helm chart repositories. So this is our um where do I go and get Helm charts from? if it's not gonna be the default, and then at, you know the project level uh, Helm charts. Uh, the other part about OpenShift, I'm, I'm, as I'm keying in on these things. Uh, so we, we, in OpenShift, we have a concept of a project. So in Kubernetes, you have a namespace, and then you have the context, and then you have the cluster config and all that stuff. So we still have the same thing here. So if I do a kubectl config, uh, get context, I can see my context. You can do my clusters. Um, with OpenShift, we deploy a kubectl package with the OC binary, and it is uh, it, it's it's feature parity with uh, with the upstream kubectl. It, there are some modifications to allow for the uh, I, I believe it's to to allow for the OpenShift API, but uh, you know, don't quote me on that. I'll I'll find out for sure and, and make sure I bring it up. Um, but again, we can see that I have my context. I also have my my config or my um, my cluster information, and then I also have my namespace. So if I do kubectl get namespace, uh, then we can see like I, I still have all of the namespaces. So now a project is a wrapper around all of those things. So if I just do oc get project, I can list all those. If I do oc project, I'm I'm literally not doing anything right now. So if I go to oc project, uh, let me just pick on where's OpenShift ingress. And now I'll do OC project. If you're familiar with Kubernetes, without a tool like kubeNS or kubectx or, or anything like that, then you end up having to write a script that does this for you or um, you know, use one of those third-party tools, you know, but essentially most people, I think, write a wrapper script that does a lot of this stuff for you and puts you in the right context. It keeps you in the namespace. Uh, but with OpenShift, it's out of the box, you know, so you get, you go to OC project and then uh, and a project is a OpenShift resource and uh, OpenShift API resource. And it, it locks you into that namespace. So all the work that you're doing at this point now can just, it'll, it'll be in this namespace until you either throw the minus N flag or you switch out of this, uh, this project. Uh, and this is a, this is a cool feature. You know, I, I, I've always, I've always thought that the project thing was cool. Uh, so if I, uh, let's see, OC get project. YAML, OpenShift, ingress. We can see that the kindest project is part of the OpenShift API. Uh, it's got its annotations and stuff like that. So we'll start seeing 
a lot of these annotate, uh, excuse me, annotations get changed. And these will look a little bit different as we start going into 4.12 with the, uh, uh, the pod admission uh, plugin or controller. Uh, when, once, once that gets implemented, then uh, we'll start seeing like varying levels of uh, you know, permissions and stuff like that getting set here. But you can see it's very similar to a namespace. You know, we have the name, uh, you know, all of our finalizers. So if I do a post to get namespace, you know, now we're using the, the Kubernetes API. You know, so this is part of the default. Uh, uh, this is just the, you know, the, the de facto API. Um, and it's pretty much the same. You know, so we have the name again. Uh, we have our finalizers, our status, all that stuff. So again, Kubernetes is OpenShift. OpenShift is Kubernetes, right? It's just a different uh, flavor. Uh, it's, a, it's an enterprise flavor of Kubernetes. So now if I, if I switch back to uh, the Linode cluster, We have our nodes. If I do a kubectl, um, I keep wanting to type that. API resources. We can see now that we don't, there's nothing for OpenShift, right? We can see that we have our Project Calico. So let's see what Project Calico does. So if we do kubectl API resources, and we do crd.project. Actually, I mean, I think I can just do project. org. Or I need to do CRD. So now with the crd.projectcalico.org API, we can see that we get BGP configured. We can see all of the resources that we have access to. So these are all the things that this API provides us, um, you know, when we install the CRD. So again, pretty cool. Uh, you know, it's it's cool to see side by side, like the, just the overall difference. So we have you know, the version one API, which is all of your primitives. Uh, then you have the app stuff for like deployments. And then, uh, you know, there's some, you know, just the, the CRDs that they installed. So with Project Calico and then with networking, I installed the Nginx um, uh, I install the Nginx ingress controller. So if I do kubectl the pods minus n, you can see the pod there. And I wonder if so. And I installed it using a chart. So I just did like a Helm install. I added the repo, did a Helm install, let it create the namespace. Um, so some of the limitations that you might see in the deployment, and I'm just gonna like backtrack into the, the public cloud here, is um, with Linode, I was only able to deploy through their managed service, a 1.23 uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I can't remember what it was for EKS. So that, that might be something that you keep in mind is, uh, you know, the, the managed services that are out there may not be the latest release. I think I think Google is probably going to be like the latest all the time, but uh, I, and I just don't remember off the top of my head what what was in EKS. Uh, but yeah, so just keep that in mind. So same thing with like Rosa and Arrow, like it'll it'll be like the latest uh, you know Y or Z stream, but or the latest release like 4.11. Uh, but it, it it may be a cycle before it goes from like 4.9, you know 4.11.9 to 4.11.11 or whatever that might be. Um, Again, so I, I created a uh, an ingress controller, and my ingress controller is mapped to my uh, load balancer out in the my node cloud. So whenever I create a uh, this is work. So whenever I create an ingress, it will point to uh, my DNS record will point to that load balancer. My ingress will set up the host name. So if I just do a K edit, and I've just this pipe crap. All I did was alias uh, K to kubectl, or alias kubectl to K. So if I do a get ingress and then do a edit on the ingress, then my new fancy dancy, I'll have upset it. K edit 
ingress, my new ingress. This is a networking.kates.io API. It kinds an ingress. Um, I'm setting up my rules, so I'm, I'm defining the host for my application. And then uh, just doing the backend service and then um, you know the, the port number and all that, and then uh, the path and path type. So this, I, I'm not sure when this changed. It might've been in like 122 or 121, but they, they started like requiring this path type uh, and path. Uh, but that's just, you know, if you've been doing it for a while and you're kind of like trying to reuse all your old stuff, then uh, yeah, it's gonna break. Um, but yeah, so I just created this ingress. And now if I go to like blog.openshift or gayrecord-ocp.com, yeah, I get the I get the service for uh, that first ingress that got created. And then if I switch it up and I go to shop, I think it's shop, I get the other service. Okay, get ingress. So just using, you know, setting up the ingress controller, which in OpenShift, this is a route. Um, and if I create an ingress in OpenShift, it will automatically create the route. Uh, but if I create a route, it won't, that's, that's gonna be confusing, I'm sorry. If I create a route, it'll just be the route in OpenShift. If I create an ingress, it will create the ingress as well as a route, uh, because that's the API that uh, the OpenShift cluster uses to talk. Um, if you have any questions, I know I'm, I'm, I'm blasting through some of the stuff and I'm talking a lot. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, I'll try and, you know, I'm trying to keep an eye on chat to make sure that I don't miss anything. But, uh, you know, if you uh, if you do have something, uh, just feel free to ask and either, you know, myself or somebody that's listening or watching, they'll uh, they'll they'll probably jump in and help you as well. Uh, so, Dwayne, do both have the same day one and day two processes or uh, are they just different? So. I think, you know, day zero is just getting get installed. I think your day one in Kubernetes and uh, OpenShift is slightly different because OpenShift comes out of the box with, you know, your ingress controller, your OAuth, like all of those things that you would be setting up by hand in, in Kubernetes. Um, so that it would put you a little bit further. I don't want to say behind, but you would you just have an extra step where you're you're implementing those services that come out of the box. Uh, with OpenShift, you know, so if you wanted to put a Kubernetes controller, or excuse me, a console for Kubernetes uh, on your cluster, you know, you'd have to install and configure that. You'd need to set up SSL and all that stuff for that, uh, certificates and all. Um, where with OpenShift, you know, the the cluster comes with a self-signed certificate that it uses, and then if you have a public cert like a you know, a, um, whatever it's called. Oh my goodness. Uh, Acme, the Acme domain, and that is something I can't think of the name right now. Um, but if you have a, like the free SSL service, then uh, you know it's it's simple in OpenShift to replace the SSL certificates because you you create the secret with your cert bundle, and then you update the ingress the, you update the uh, the ingress controller resource. You just patch it with the new secret name, and then it'll add that secret. You'll see the pod cycle. And um, if you wanted to change the API, it's, it's almost the same flow. Like you do, it, it's a little bit uh, different, but essentially the same idea. You create the secret, you patch a resource, and then the API pods will start rolling. And then they'll all be, uh, you know, SSL, uh, backed by SSL. Um, I'm going to try and log into my other cluster here. Uh, let's see. All right, cool. So this is a 4.10 cluster that I have, and I just want to talk about like machine sets and machine configs. So if I do an OC get machine sets. I'm going to switch to the project so I don't have to keep typing it in. Open shift machine API. OC machine sets. And if we take a look at the machine set, you 
you can see that it's part of, again, it's the machine OpenShift API. Uh, we're defining, you know, just some, some labels and stuff like that. But the, the, the goodness here is like, it's a, this is uh, like a machine set is a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a replica set essentially, right? So the machine set manages the machines. Uh, so how a replica set manages pods, a machine set manages machines. Um, and so we create a machine set, it will generate a machine, that machine starts spinning up. And as it goes to through its installation uh, and, and as the API is bringing it up, then the, it'll, it'll create a node resource. And so uh, once the node goes from a not ready to ready state, that means that like the full uh, machine API has done its thing. So it's, it's created the resource in your you know, public cloud or in your VMware environment or wherever. And then it has added it to the cluster. And then it's now scheduled uh, for your workloads. So whatever that workload may be. Um, and again, we're just, the machine sets are generated by the cluster using an API install. And so you get like this, uh, it, you know, it adds the cluster name and then it also adds this uh, UID or GUID or whatever you want to call it. And then it's just telling you which uh, role the machine has and what region it's in or availability zone, availability zone in region. Uh, now, if you notice, there are no machine sets for control plane nodes. Machine sets. It's only for the worker nodes. Uh, so if we do an OC get machines, we see that we also, but we have like the machines for uh, for our control plane. So just keep in mind that the machine sets are for the uh, the worker or compute nodes, and uh, that the the control plane will it'll generate a machine, but it it won't have to do um, or it won't generate a machine set. So you'll you still manage you know your control plane nodes uh, as you know not really as cattle or not really as pets, but like pretty much as pets. Um, let's see. Hello, in memory of Bud Spencer, uh, and no way says, um, do we have information or experience with the forensic container checkpointing, uh, snapshotting a container for security analysis? I do not. Um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, uh, the nested. Um, or sandbox containers is what you're talking about. Um, but no, I, I, I don't have any information on that. If you shoot me an email, uh, my email is johnny at redhat.com. If you shoot me an email with your question, I'll, I'll send the, your question out and uh, see if there's anything that we can, uh, you know, get back to you that's helpful. Is there anything in, like, in, uh, like specifically that you're looking for or just information? Um, so then... Moving on, like we have our, so we've, we've talked about machine sets. So machine sets create machines, machines turn into nodes. So if we do an OC get nodes and we do OC get machines, we can see that, you know, we have a, a match. You know, we have a machine for a node. Um, now there's also a thing called a machine config. And a machine config is what we use to apply a, um, it's what we use to apply a configuration to the core OS machines. So um, if we need to update the SSHD config or if we need to, um, you know, we need to put like a, some change on the system, then, you know, we would create a machine config and we would push that out. If you've done any type of disconnected install or you've added your own catalog or if you've ever messed with the image content source policy, um, essentially what happens is you create that, that image content source policy, and then that updates the uh, registries.conf that gets distributed out to the nodes. So that's that's kind of like, if you think about it from a workflow perspective, um, I've, I created an ICSP, I apply it to my cluster, it creates the machine config, the machine config gets applied to the cluster, or to the nodes in the cluster. Um, and you can define which nodes get which machine config, or you can define it by label. So if you have infrastructure nodes, or if you have uh, compute nodes, or if you or worker or or control planes, then you can by label create a machine config that would get applied, uh, that gets applied to that machine, and then you have the machine config pool, which is the pooling of all the machine configs for that um, uh, that type. You know, so if you have like say ten 
and, and there, it, that pool would be like the the um, the, the grouping of all of them together. Um, with Kubernetes, like raw vanilla Kubernetes, right? It, it comes down to machine management is very much on you. Uh, you either spin up a new VM and then use automation like Ansible or or Terraform or Ansible and Terraform or something else um, to create these resources and then uh, you know check them into the cluster, add them to the cluster, and then you know mark them as schedulable and stuff like that. So it, it's it's still a manual process. I know that the machine API, uh, or I shouldn't say I know. I, I've I've heard rumblings that the machine API is going to be um, part of Kubernetes, but I'm, I'm not really sure where I heard that now as I'm saying it. So uh, hopefully it's true because it's an awesome, uh, it's an awesome tool. Um, then the other part of this too, is that like with, with your nodes, we, we provide a DNS operator. So all of the internal comms, you know, it's using this uh, DNS operator uh, within your cluster. And, um, you know, so whenever you add a node, you know, all of that stuff gets updated within your internal DNS. Uh, all of your services, they, they're all aware of all of these things because of the, the uh, service addresses and stuff like that. So uh, Kubernetes, once you add the cluster in and you have DNS set up and um, you get it added in, then the services and stuff like that, they'll be able to talk to it as well. Um, but just keep in mind that, you know, with, you know, with OpenShift out of the box, there is a DNS service for all of the, you know, in cluster comms. Uh, the other thing about OpenShift is the other other thing about OpenShift is that you know it, it's it's geared for infrastructure people, but it's also um, driven around developer experience and user experience. You know, so like that's why the console is so robust, and that's why there's these different contexts within the console. So that way, as a user, you you have a the ability to go out and create an image or create an application fairly quickly, and also um, you know, have the resources where you can go and you can look at the topology or you can do all these things. With OpenShift, we also have uh, build configs and image streams. So an image stream is a reference to an image. You know, so if I do a OC get um, image stream minus N OpenShift. So I just want to look at all of the image streams that are in the OpenShift namespace. Um, we can see that there's there's quite a few, um, but the one that I like to use because I'm, I'm an infrastructure person by, by uh, trade is I'll use this, um, well, the toolbox or tools here. So what this tools is, is it's essentially a UBI image with, um, it's got like get installed, curls installed. So there's all these different tools that you can, that we normally need that we we build a custom image for. And now we can just call this by the image stream name, which is pretty awesome. And you can see that it's pointed to my internal registry. And so, um, essentially, if I wanted to use this in a pipeline, so uh, if I had like a you know, Tekton or something like that, I could use my registry name here or within my build config, I could actually just use my image stream name and it will use that image to do whatever task I'm trying to do. So say if I'm, I need to do something with Git, it'll use that image to run like Git pull or Git fetch or whatever I'm wanting to do. Uh, there's another one called uh, CLI, grep CLI. And what this is, this is the OpenShift client. So this image that's sitting out in a cluster, you can use this to run OC commands on your cluster. So say you need to run an imperative job. Uh, you need to do something with the OC command, but you don't, you don't want to sit on the command line and do all these things. You want to have it as part of your CI, CD or GitOps process or workflow. You can create a job that will call this image, and then you can run your OC commands within uh, within that pod. And it's nice because now you don't have to build an image. You don't, there's no custom image building that you have to pull in uh, to do all these things. You have a lot of these tools already part of your deployment. Um, so the image streams are really awesome. Let's take a look at what, what this uh, CLI one looks like. So if we do an OC git minus O YAML image stream, come on little buddy. Oh, I said an open shift. All right, so we can see that, you know, it's an open shift API. Uh, it's an image stream and it's pulling the image from this file, right? And then it's really just mapping, uh, you know, this, this path to 
that CLI dot latest, right? So um, we can see that the latest tag is, or the tag is latest. And what will end up happening is if we updated this image or if there was an update to this image, then you could actually, um, uh, you would see both versions in here. And then the latest would be like the newest version. Uh, so then you could actually call out that like, hey, let me, let me do this thing. Um, so if you're wondering, how do I use an image stream this is going to fail, but I'll just show you. Um, so if you do an OC new app and you do minus I for image stream, and then you did CLI, it will create a deployment and then it will create a pod. So let's do an OC status. And we can see all the stuff's being created. So we have, uh, we have our deployment. So let's do an OC get pods. And I've got this here. And the reason why it's in a back loop, the crash loop back off is because um, it's it's meant to be run with a command, right? So it's meant to be run with a container and then like your string after that. So OC, you know, OC get pods minus N, whatever. Um, so that's just one small bad example of using an image stream from the command line. Uh, but there's also other image streams out there. So like HTTPD. So if you're used to Kubernetes or you do a kubectl create deployment, you know, you give it the name, you tell it the image, you tell it the port. Um, essentially, that's what OC new app is doing. But if I wanted to get crazy and run kubectl, uh, let me actually create a new namespace. OC delete all minus L app equals CLI. So OC new project, and I'm just going to call it um, demo. All right, and so when I create a new project, uh, it automatically rolls me into OC new project. So let's let's do this example right here. So we'll just do a, uh, oh, you know what? I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna do it this way. I'm gonna use kubectl. And so we'll use kubectl create deployment. And again, you know, minus minus image, the image path, and then, uh, you know, this is the command to run. So when you see this double hyphen here, it's basically saying I've done with I'm done with all the Kubernetes things. Now I'll go do something else. And so this is actually passing the command to the container or to the application. And so on my OpenShift cluster, I just use kubectl. I'm just gonna stick with it. Oh, and that's funny because I didn't. All right, so now I have my pod running. Now I don't have a route. All right, so I have a deployment. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna expose this deployment. So it was kubectl. Hello node. Oh, they don't have a port in it, okay. All right, let's see. Oh, tab completion. Uh, so let's do Let's see, exposed deployment. It's port 80. And yes, thank you, Arhope9, for, for uh, sharing that. That's awesome. Really appreciate it. And then. Well, I'm gonna have to walk through this. Been a while. There we go. Let's 
service and then hello node. And then let's just see if this worked. This is probably gonna be crazy. So it may not be ready yet. Um, let's see, so uh, Shandon, I'm sorry if I butchered your name, I apologize. Uh, how do I mount the certificate on containers? Usually in Kubernetes, it, uh, I can mount the volume, but I couldn't find a way to do this. Um, I'm trying to avoid the route for SSL thing. Um, so you, I, I mean, yeah, you could add it in as a config map and then mount it as a volume. Uh, you could, um, and then your route would, I know you don't want to do routes, but then your route would be passed through, which essentially handles, it passes the SSL termination down to the pod. Um, the other way would be to do exactly what you don't want to do, where you put the SSL certificate on the route itself. So you could create an edge route and put the certs there. Um, if you are trying to do a per, um, like a per container or per deployment uh, certificate, uh, then yeah, I you probably just have to mount it into the pod. So you could either, um, you know, create a secret with it and then mount it that way or use the secret or, uh, you know, try and mount it in as a uh, config map or, you know, put it on a route. All right, so this app is broke and it's probably me, just so you know, it's probably, it's probably me. So let's do the other example that we had. But anyways, I, I just wanted to show you, you know, like we can still use kubectl to create applications and um, you know, with the image streams and stuff like that, it's it's a cool resource because it's a it's a nice name to map down to um, you know images that are living in a registry somewhere. You know, so you know that quay dot you know quay at you know SHA and then the, the SHA uh, maps back to an image in the image registry in the internal registry, and then now you can reference that via a nice name, you know, like a CLI or whatever. Um, and then you can easily spin these apps up with OC new app. Um, the other resource that comes with OpenShift is uh, a build config. And a build config is a way for you to um, describe how to build an application. So then you have things like source to image. Um, you could do different variants of that, like you can use a Docker file. So say if you have a, a Docker file with all the source code out in Git, um, you could create a build config that points to that, and then it will create the build config. Uh, it'll create the build, it'll build the image in your cluster, it'll create the image stream, and then it becomes available as an application, uh, you know, for you, for you to deploy. Um, the other thing, and this is a feature that is, I dare say, it's going to be deprecated at some point. It's not deprecated yet, but it's called a template. So if we get OC get templates, minus N, open shift. Um, a template is essentially that, right? It is a it is a config that's already in place that you can pass parameters to. So, say if I wanted to run this um, SSO 74 HTTPS, I'll just do OC get minus O YAML template 74 HTTPS. It's in OpenShift. We can see that we have this is just the description of all the fields and like what's required and what's not, but it's, it's the resources to deploy, you know, SSO 74 with HTTPS. So you, we can see like we've got our deployment here with the probes and uh, this might actually be a deployment config. But again, we have these values that can be overridden and they, we can pass these values into it. Um, and templates are, they're still available, but from what I understand, they are eventually going to be deprecated. Um, I don't know when, and I'm not really sure uh, what the, the mindset behind it is, but um, essentially you, you put all of these resources into a single template and then now you can, you can deploy the single resource, pass your parameters to it, and then it will deploy everything for you. So you can do things like routes, deployments, deployment configs, um, and then uh, config maps, secrets, all that stuff, all in a single command. Um, I, I think it might be going the way of upstream Kubernetes, which is Helm or, you know, some other type of application uh, delivery uh, mechanism. Uh, but yeah, just know that there's an OC get VC, yeah. So a build config is you can either generate one from a 
uh, running an OC new app, or you can provide your own build config. Let's see if we can do OC explain build config. And it, yeah, I, this was not a good example. Hmm. Thanks, I hope none. Appreciate you sharing that. Let's encrypt is the uh, <laughs> certain thing that I was talking about earlier. My goodness, I cannot think of that. Um, but if we look at this build config, um, and if you're not sure what I just ran. So if you run OC explain, and then the resource that you want, and this works in oopctl explain build config. You can use kubectl and kubectl explain, um, and you can also use uh, OC explain, and this will give you the information that you need. Uh, no. Um, this will give you all the information that you need. So if you pass recursive to this uh, OC explain, then it'll, it'll give you all of the details. Now, this is awesome if you're trying to do uh, your CKA or your CKAD, or if you are uh, trying to figure something out and you don't have access to the internet to go look at documentation or whatever. If you do an OC explain, it'll tell you all of the all of the um, the items that can go into that spec. So just something nice, to, another tool to just kind of have in your back pocket. Um, and I know I'm, I'm running late here. I, I don't think I was going to be talking this much, so I apologize. Uh, the other thing is uh, deployment config. And if I just do an OC get DC, let's say. Um, and I don't have one. So let's do an OC explain deployment config. Now, a deployment config and a deployment are very, very, very similar. Uh, you use a deployment config. There's there's actually a document out there uh, and I'll have to find it and, and uh, remember for next time. But there's the explanation I think is if you want to have consistency, then you use um, uh, a deployment config. If you want to, and I don't remember what the one was for deployment and I could be mixing it up, but essentially uh, a deployment config is what you would use. It's an OpenShift API object. Uh, it's very, very similar to um, uh, a deployment. Uh, deployment configs are eventually being replaced by ju just deployments, right? We're going to go full um, uh, Kubernetes uh, native on uh, the deployments. So you can see, like, even with the operators, if we do an OC get deploy minus A, there's a ton of deployments that are out there. And um, th thank you. Deployment is availability. And deployment config is consistency and like there's a, there's a full blurb on it i'll find it and uh i'll i'll put it in the in the uh notes for it the next time we have a stream so that way uh we can bring it up and talk about it but yeah it, it's essentially they're they're so similar they really are um so let's look at if we do an oc explain deployment config uh recursive because we want to see all the everything we, we set up our containers, we set up our images, we set up our volumes, our volume mounts, we, you know, we pass our environments, uh, we can pass our secrets. Uh, if we want to use a specific service account, we apply all of this. And um, our hope nine, that is, so I, I do OC and kube explain. And then when I take an Ansible exam, I have another terminal up and I have Ansible dash doc and I'm waiting, like, just whatever I'm trying to figure out. That way, I just go, like, right to it, and I can see it. Um, yeah, I, I love the built-in uh, man pages. Like, they're just they're awesome. But, yeah, it, it's, you can see that it's so – it's very familiar. It's very similar to a uh, deployment. Uh, the thing that you get out of a deployment config as well is – let me see if I can find it. It's a uh, – I think it's part of the uh, rolling update. It's part of the strategy. Um, I think that the strategy in the deployment config is a little bit different where you can do, uh, you can tweak how, how the, the pods get rolled out. Um, let's see if, minus I. Yeah. And then. 
a5, b5. All right, that's what it is. It's the triggers. And so essentially, you can do, you can determine how your triggers get uh, uh, implemented. So on update, like on image change, uh, if you have, uh, you know, it, you deployed a deployment config or you, you've used a deployment config to deploy your application. If there is a new version that gets pushed into a registry, it will roll out, uh, it, it'll trigger the deployment config rollout. Um, so that's some pretty cool capability that's built into that. I, I think Kubernetes has something very similar. I, I'm just, I'd be lying if I tried to explain it. Um, so the big things out of the OpenShift API are again, routes and routes. If you think about it back in the day, gave us access to um, TLS. So we can encrypt our ingress coming in. Um, we have builds and build configs, which are meant to help our developers and our application developers uh, deploy their application, that experience of deploying the application on the cluster is to make that better and easier. Um, things like source to image where you can, um, you can actually, you know, have your Git repo, you can have a .s2i directory, and then you can have some build scripts that are like stored within Git. And then once that S2I gets called in, it'll build the image based off of those scripts. And, um, or you could do a Docker file like we were talking about earlier. You have your container file or Docker file sitting out in your Git repo that has all the instructions with all the source code kind of wrapped around it and build your image that way and then deploy. Um, and then we also have projects, which are the um, the bringing together, right? It's the, it's the bringing together of the, the context of the cluster, the cluster information, the namespace, and uh, it, there's also some auth, uh, um, uh, authorization built in as well. So within a namespace, you get default SECs, uh, or, or um, um, I'm trying to think of the right word. There's there's default permissions, right? So uh, essentially, like if you're in a namespace, uh, you can create the things depending on your role within that namespace. You can create all the things within it, or I can lock it down and only allow um, people that are part of like a certain group um, are about why words are hard today. I need Andrew. I miss Andrew. Um, but we need, uh, there's our back built in where we can lock a namespace down like extremely tight. And then uh, we can also lock down the namespaces to where I can only do things within my namespace. I'm only scoped at this level. So using, using our back, I can lock it down there and then I can add a network policy uh, and then I can add, just, there's just all these things now that we can build to build out the strength of our security in our clusters. Um, we also have templates, which are eventually going to go um, the way of the Dodo Bird. You know, like they are, they're pretty cool if you use them. Um, they're neat and they deploy all the resources, you know, pretty consistently. And it's cool how you can pass the parameters to it, but it's, it's just something that, you know, things like Helm, make it a little bit easier to, um, you know, reuse and stuff like that. And uh, I, I just, I, I think that's the way we're going. I'm just not, yeah, I wish I could say it with a hundred percent confidence, but I'm saying it with like 80% confidence. Uh, and then uh, again, the deployment config, which is on parity with uh, a deployment, but it's just got some added features, you know, some open, open shift goodies, like the triggers and uh, rollout strategies and stuff like that. Um, the other one is, the, the last one I'll talk about is the SEC, which is the secure uh, security context constraint. So if I do uh, like an OC get SEC, um, the default SEC in OpenShift 4.11 and below is restricted. All right, and what restricted does is it out of the box kind of limits you to what you can do. You know, so it you just can't go ham, right? Like you're you're not an admin, so things that require cluster level permissions you will not be able to do because you don't have the RBAC for it. Um, so you know, restricted is um, there's it says nothing about capabilities here, but you must run as and then must run as range. And so what this really means is like you have to have a user ID in your in your container, right? So it, it'll one will be generated and it'll run as that user. So like a thousand and one or something like that. Um, so this is where people, I think, struggle coming from Kubernetes to OpenShift because in Open or in Kubernetes, you don't necessarily have these uh, 
security context constraints, right? Like you're running either as any UID or uh, you're using um, host path or host networking. Like you need some of these extra capabilities uh, from the permission level that OpenShift out of the box says no. You know, like we, we don't allow any UID. We don't allow run as root. We don't allow um, a host path without a override. Um, so just keep in mind if you're thinking about like, oh, okay, I'll just take my app that runs any UID or UID, whatever it is, run as root, whatever, on Kubernetes and everything is right as rain, everything's perfect. You're, you're probably going to struggle coming to OpenShift because, uh, especially if you have host path calls, uh, because you have to add that SEC to that user uh, or to that service account to allow it to access that host path. Um, and we can see some of the other SECs. So we have any UID, we have host access. Host mount, any UID, host network, and these are just part of like your normal capability type things. Um, node exporter, non-root, privileged, and restricted. In version 4.11, uh, because this is a 4.10 cluster, they, we, Red Hat, OpenShift, has put in a restricted dash v2 um, SEC. And right now it's there, but not all of the uh, features of it are in use. But in 4.12, they will be. And what that means is in this restricted V2 SEC, it drops all of the capabilities. And so if you need to have any like additional capability, you actually have to go in and add that back in. Uh, it's just, it's more restrictive and it's for the overall health and security of the cluster. Um, and it's just to make sure that, you know, if we have a process, we're gonna lock that process in, in place and we're not gonna let it, we're gonna make it as difficult as possible for that process to jump out and, and go do something crazy. So like what uh, No Way was asking about earlier, um, you know, it, it's gonna be one of those things where, uh, you know, when you're trying to uh, inspect a, a container, we're, this is gonna make it difficult to do that. Um, that's, it, it's not that it won't be doable because you can you can modify the SEC or you can, you can add privileges and stuff like that to it, but uh, out of the box, it, it's probably gonna be complicated. Uh, just to get it done. Uh, and, you know, obviously privileged is, it's not, it, it's, it's, you've got all the access to all the capabilities. You can pretty much run as whoever you want to, um, you know, you're privileged. So you can run, you can pretty much do anything with this. And ideally what you want to do is you, you never want to use privilege, right? Uh, you, privilege might be like a debug thing. Like, okay, let me, let me just add privilege to see if this is a permission thing. So you'd give it the privilege as to see, you know, stand it up. Like, okay, that works with privilege. Now you start rolling back and trying to figure out like what, what's actually blocking you. Um, but you'd never want to have the de facto SCC for your service account to be privileged. Uh, just like you never want to use cluster admin, even though I'm, I'm exclusively using cluster admin on all three of my clusters right here. Don't do what I do, you know, especially in production. You, know, you, you want to have OAuth set up. You want to have, uh, your RBAC set up really well. And um, you want you want to keep that control, like the tight control over that, because as you know, cluster admin is um, uh, like mean machine Rex is my discord link or somebody else's like that. I, did I post the wrong link. Um, but yeah, you, you want to definitely have like full control over who has like the, uh, the super access to everything. Uh, because you don't want to, uh, you don't want to let your cluster get blown up. Um, SCC projects will still use SCC as before. You need to enable version two to create projects for testing. Exactly. And then in 4.12, if you um, if you update from 4.11 to 4.12, then everything that you had working in 4.11 uh, will be working, uh, or it will continue to work. But if you build a brand new cluster as 4.12, uh, this restricted V2 and then the uh, pod, um, the the new uh, the pod security controller is going to be uh, very restrictive. So it's going to drop all the capabilities. Like it, it's it's the the security is being tightened down. Um, and mean machine Rex, just so you know, like I had to refresh the chat because there was uh, some spam. So I I actually don't see the link that you're talking about anymore. So I apologize. Uh, if you want to repaste it. Exactly. Yep. Our hope nine. Exactly right. Um, let's see. Yeah. So I, I think that's unless you guys have some questions. I mean, I've, I've been rambling on and and hopefully not droning on. You know, hopefully y'all are still awake and you know, not snoozing. But um, just to kind of recap what we talked about, you know, like OpenShift 
is uh, it's batteries included enterprise Kubernetes. You know, it's very opinionated, uh, but there's it's not so opinionated that you can't roll things back, you know, or you can't undo certain things. Um, you know, like if you're a partner, you know, there's things that you can loosen up to get your application to work and then, you know, batten it back down. And I, as a good example of this, like I had a customer where they had they had their own build, their own build images or my goodness, they had their own build processes. And when they went from a Kubernetes into OpenShift, you know, we had to roll back some of the restrictions to get their application working. And then as soon as we got the application working, we started identifying like, okay, what, what's the thing that's causing us to stop? And, um, you know, we're able to then, you know, create the, the RBAC that's required or, you know, create an SCC that if we need to, that adds the permission that they need for that one thing or for this, for whatever thing that they need to get that application working. Um, because at the end of the day, right, we, we want OpenShift to be usable and we want you, we want your experience as a developer, as an infrastructure administrator or engineer, we want that to be good, right? We want, we want it to be excellent actually. And, um, you know, that's, it's important to us as, as a, you know, a product, a seller of product, uh, to make sure that your experience is, is outstanding. And, uh, you know, if you're deploying clusters that you can deploy clusters easily, uh, if you're an application developer that your, your app dev experience in OpenShift and your app dev experience, and then your app deployment experience is a, uh, is a good experience. Um, yeah, our hope nine, exactly. Doing stupid stuff is still possible. It always goes back to that thing like, well, you, you could do that, but should you do that? You know, like that's, I, I feel like I've probably said that to, you know, five or 10 different customers, you know, like, yeah, you, you could do it that way, but, you know, should you actually do it that way? Uh, and yeah, I think that with, compared to, to upstream Kubernetes or vanilla or raw Kubernetes, whatever you want to call it, um, I think overall, if you are, um, if you are happy with your Kubernetes experience, you know, so you're, you're, you're comfortable creating deployments, you're comfortable deploying applications, you're comfortable managing the cluster. I think that you'll find um, a bit of a learning curve with OpenShift just because there's a learning curve with anything that's new. Um, and then I think that you'll find that there's some things that we've made. Uh, <laughs> that's so true. One is to be happy and two is to, yeah, not open tickets. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, it, I think that you'll go to OpenShift and you'll find that there are things that we do that really simplify a lot of these things. Like machine management is so off. That's probably my, if I had to pick my favorite feature of OpenShift 4, it is the OpenShift machine API. Just like being able to scale up machines and create different machine sets with different resources and stuff like that. And then, and then just be able to roll them out and know that they're going to roll out. I, I think it's so, it, it's just awesome. Um, but then I think that if you're going, you know, from a Kubernetes deployment and you're used to implementing all of the security hardening, like uh, Rick had made a comment earlier about if you go through the Kubernetes hardening guide, there's a lot, there's a lot to digest. There's a lot to implement. Uh, and a lot of those things we implement out of the box. And then we have tools like ACS where there's also a, um, um, an operator that was built that will, uh, oh, our hope nine. I'm not sure if you remember what this is. I can't remember what it's called right now. Um, but it's essentially like it goes through and it applies the, the NIST or, you know, SIGs and, um, it'll tell you the status of your, your security posture on one, your cluster, but it'll also tell you the security posture of your, um, um, your host, you know, I have SSH wide open to the whole world and I'm allowing no password and no SSH. You know what I mean? Like it'll be stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah, the cluster auto scaler is yeah. Yeah. Legit. And, um, man, I wish I could remember, I wish I could use my words appropriately, uh, but I can't. Um, but yeah, so the, this other operator that, are, you know, teams at Red Hat have built and they're, they put out there for everyone to use. Um, they'll make sure that your cluster is, is secure. And I think that like tools like that, uh, things like cert manager operator, and then there's another operator uh, I, that I also cannot remember the name of uh, that it, in, in cert manager, if you create a cert manager uh, resource, it will automatically update the ingress. If you, oh, thank you so much. It's the compliance operator. Thank you, our hope nine, you saved me. It's the compliance operator. Um, and the compliance operator will do 
uh, you know, like NIST, it'll do uh, different uh, categories of uh, security. And it's been a while since I've used it. I don't know if, it, if you can actually um, apply or if, uh, if it'll do like auto remediation. I think there are some, some cases where it'll do the auto remediation, but it'll definitely tell you um, like, hey, you've got this out of sync or you need to fix this, here's the fix. Uh, and then I, there are some cases where you can remediate certain things, but I, I'm sure that there's others that you have to go out and apply them manually, create a machine config and roll it out. Um, but rolling back to Cert Manager and, and, and the ingress object, it will automatically update the certificates because the ingresses can use a secret for the certs, uh, whereas a route cannot. And so there's an operator that was created uh, by some of the people at Red Hat that will it, it'll essentially parse that secret of the TLS certificates and break it up and then apply that to uh, to the to the route the way that it needs to be uh, updated. So that way, now you've got automated certificates. Uh, if you if you want to use Cert Manager or if you want to do Let's Encrypt and just do the whole thing, totally fine. That's also doable because you just up, update the ingress. But if you wanted to use Cert Manager, so that way you're actually creating certificates for your individual applications, um, and you're not just going ham and doing a wildcard, then um, you know the Cert Manager plus the whatever the one we have Red Hat is uh, that that updates the routes. There's all these things that are out there to make your life easier and to make your OpenShift cluster more secure. Um, where in Kubernetes, you have a lot of those same resources, but a lot of them, uh, you know, they're in somebody's blog or they're in somebody's GitHub where the Red Hat stuff is out, at least out in the marketplace. Uh, there is some, you know, it may not be like the most extensive uh, processing to get those things in. Red Hat certified operators, totally different story. Like in the community, uh, I think that there's just like certain things that you have to do. And, um, it, you know, then your operators out in the community marketplace. but you know, at least there's some process that has to be followed to get that thing in there where, you know, you could be copying and pasting YAML or, you know, cloning something that could potentially, you know, bust your cluster. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, I love Kubernetes. I love OpenShift. I think that they're both awesome. And I, I would not know what I know about OpenShift today had I not taken that, uh, that trip down the Kubernetes path because it really, it really helped me focus on, okay, here's why I'm doing this, you know? So it was really like, it was the why behind all of the deployment configs and the OpenShift APIs and routes and all that stuff, which I, I don't think I was maybe connecting internally uh, before. And so um, I think they're both awesome. I, I think if you're looking for a batteries included solution uh, that's tunable, just not overly tunable, then OpenShift is the answer. Uh, if you're looking for something to just go kick the tires and get stuff out there and, and something that you can upgrade to a production level uh, service, you know, Kubernetes is also the answer. Um, so I, I'll give you guys a couple seconds to ask any more questions if you have any. I, I, again, I've been rambling on, and I apologize because uh, <laughs> normally I try and just let Andrew do all the talking. Um, but yeah, that's it for me. Our Hope Nine, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you um, uh, jumping in and and helping me out with uh, the chat. And same thing with Christian and Rick too, and Dwayne. Yeah, appreciate all you guys. Uh, yeah, the file integrity operator, that's another one. Uh, and then, so file integrity operator, and then you have OpenShift logging. There's all these, yeah, all these pieces that you can add in, these Legos that you could just keep adding on. And then you can have this Superman's Fortress of Solitude. And it'll just be awesome. And uh, it, super secure, but still, you know, still super usable. You know, and I think that that's, as, as a security practitioner and stuff like that, you know, I, that's ultimately the goal, unless you're a no engineer. Uh, yeah, you want, you want to be as secure as possible while still making it consumable and usable by your, your engineers uh, because that affects revenue. And uh, yeah, I, it's pretty incredible. And we're, we're part of something like as it's happening, which is also incredible. And well, anytime. Uh, you know, hope, hopefully you found it uh, insightful. Hopefully you got some good information. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free, you know, to reach out to me on, you know, pretty much anywhere. You know, Reddit, JRockTX. Um, I'm at uh, Twitter at JRockTX1. And then I'm also uh, Johnny at RedHat.com. So if you have an email or if you have any questions, just let me know. And I'm going to put Andrew's stuff up here too. So Andrew's at, at Practical Andrew on Twitter. He's at Practical Andrew on um, uh, Reddit as well. And we also, we answer email all the time. 
and uh, I, I've I've been trying to be good about Slack, but I'm also uh, I'm also terrible about Slack. And then this is the OpenShift users uh, Slack channel in the um, Kubernetes Slack. Um, let's see, Kevin's, uh, Kev's in game says, can you talk about Kubernetes operator and its OpenShift applications? Um, so an operator is a, uh, it's, you know, this is Johnny Rickard's unofficial, you know, explanation of what an operator is, but it's a controller. So the operator gets built, it's, it's got pods, it's got deployments, it's got resources that it watches. And then it's also got a reconciler. And what happens is that reconciler, it, it it's essentially playing good cop, bad cop, right? So if if I've deployed this Kubernetes or this operator, and I've deployed an instance of that operator, um, the the operator will uh, will go around and it'll reconcile and it says, hey, are you in the state that I'm expecting you to be in? If yes, all right, cool, we'll do the Kubernetes uh, high five and move on. Uh, if not, then it will apply the uh it'll reconcile what is supposed to be the state so if there's a difference then it'll reconcile that change and it'll make the change it'll change it back essentially so that's the bad cut part um so in very simple terms it's a it's a controller that watches resources and it will um you know checks the state so it, it will it'll take it and then it'll roll it back uh can we upgrade resources of a deployment so, yeah yeah there's there's fields within like the so so the operator that gets deployed, uh, it'll have the CRD. So that, that makes that resource available. So say if it's just called storage, it'll make kind storage available. And then what you do is you create an instance of that. And that's the that's the configurable aspect, right? That's that manifest that you're writing that has those values in it. So it'd be like kind storage, namespace, the name, you know, the size, the volume type, whatever, right? File system, whatever, whatever you would put in there. And then you would apply that config. So anything that would, um, anything, any instance that the operator deploys would be what's part of the reconciler. That individual instance that you created would be outside of that. And so essentially that would create like the, the pod or the deployment or the resource. And then um, the operator will just make sure that that thing is always applied. You know, so if the, if the replicas are set to three, it'll make sure that you always have three replicas, that kind of thing. Um, but if you were to go back and modify the actual deployment of the operator, it will 100% change it back to uh, what it's supposed to be. Availability of OCP, OPP plus for Arrow and Rosa. Um, in memory of, of Bud Spencer, um, I don't know for sure uh, about that. I can definitely find out. Um, I feel like this came up the other day uh, because it, it is a subscription, but because you're doing, you're using Rosa, um, because you're using Rosa or ARO, a managed service, uh, it's a different subscription. So I, I assume it's probably there. You just have to apply that sub uh, to get access to that, that uh, content. Um, but I, I would think maybe out of the box is probably not part of it, um, but I'll find out for sure. I should know the people to talk to, uh, to, to get that for you. And so I'll bring that up. Uh, I'll make a note to bring that up next uh, next stream, uh, or if you want to email me and just ask me, uh, you know, feel free and I will uh, reply back to you. Uh, let's see here, and I'll I'll give Andrew a break and I'll put my stuff up here. So again, if you guys want to reach out to me and ask me any questions or ask Andrew and I any questions, uh, feel free. You know, we we do love the feedback. The chat is awesome. Uh, our Hope Nine has been one of our uh, um, you know continuous viewers, and like we love the feedback and. Uh, the questions and stuff like that. So please keep coming out and, uh, you know, if you're watching on YouTube or Twitch or whatever, you know, make sure you like and subscribe to the videos so that way we know that we're, uh, you know, hopefully making an impact and positive impact. Uh, and Kevin's in game or Kev's in game. Yeah, anytime. You know, uh, any other questions? Uh, one thing that Andrew and I like to say, mainly Andrew, but I like to repeat it, is uh, you know, there's no there's no dumb questions, right? Like if you feel like you're like, man, this is like, I don't know if I should ask this. Ask it because we, uh, you know, we'll we'll answer anything. And and simple questions make us feel smart, you know. So it's a it's a confidence builder for us. Uh, so yeah, feel free to, you know, ask whatever you got to, and we'll we'll be happy to help out.
And yeah, anytime in memory of Bud Spencer, uh, anytime. Glad to do it. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and end the stream now. But again, if you have any questions, hit us up and we'll be um, be glad to help you out. Uh, no, not at all, I hope not, not at all. Uh, just to recap again, I'm sorry. I know I said I was gonna leave it now. I can't stop talking. Um, next week, there will be no stream. There's the what's next with 4.12. So that's uh, essentially a live stream of what's gonna be in the 4.12 release uh, or what's what's expected to land in 4.12. Um, and then the week after in the US is uh, Thanksgiving uh, holiday. So we are not gonna be streaming that week. So the week after Thanksgiving, I believe is the 30th uh, or the 1st of December, I can't remember. Uh, we'll we'll be back in uh, yeah, back in action, getting back after it. So I hope you all have a great weekend. If you're in the states, have a happy Thanksgiving. If you're not in the states, uh, have a happy Thanksgiving uh, wherever it is that you are. <laughs> I don't know what it's called there. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next week on the 4.12. What's next? Have a great week.